good morning, Hassan. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, thanks, thanks for making the time to to talk to me this morning. I know how how busy you are, uh, so it's much uh, appreciated. Um, I, I wanted this invitation. I wanted to start by asking you. Um, I mean, you were in Gaza during the first intifada, during the second intifada. You were there again during uh, a massacre in 2008 and 2009, Operation Gas Lead. Then again in 2012, in 2014, you were there for the Great March of Return in 2018. You've also traveled and worked in, in Syria, Lebanon, Yemen, Iraq, um, and you were in Gaza again in um, towards the end of October, November in 2023. I wanted to ask you what's in a way, what's different this time? I think the difference is that is the difference between a flood and a tsunami. It's about the severity and the scale and the intention and the target. Uh, that's what makes it different. What's different is is that the fact that the health system and its destruction was a main part of the military strategy. Uh, and what's different is the genocidal intent, and you can see the gen. You know, I mean, now in retrospect, you can te- you can see the difference. You know, the war war is an attack on the on the present in order to alter the future. Uh, 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 genocide uh, attacks the present and the past in order to erase the future. And therefore, the scale is different and the targets are different. I mean, because I know I, I covered also um, and had, you know, I had friends who were there in 2008, 2009. Um, you know, it's not unusual at all for Israel to target, you know, hospitals, schools, mosques. Um, but when you say the scale is different, what do you mean by that? Well, it's one thing to attack hospitals. It's another thing to dismantle the health system because the attack on the hospital is a is one component of dismantling the health system. To attack every hospital systematically and those hospitals that reopen to go back and, and attack them again like they did with Shifa, like they did with the Indonesian hospital. And then to kill over 400 doctors and nurses, over 55 uh, uh, consultant and specialist level doctors um, to destroy all the medical schools, uh, to destroy the water and sewage treatment and people's homes so that they, you, you can uh, 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 create um, epidemics of infectious diseases uh, and then to manufacture a, um, a famine. That's the destruction of, of the health system. Unlike attacking the health system, I wanted to ask you also while you were there in in for you know for a few uh, how long did you stay for a few weeks? Uh, uh, Forty three days. Forty three days. Um, Israel says that it's targeting Hamas and Hamas fighters. Israel says or claims it's killed about you know fourteen thousand Hamas fighters Wh- while you were there working in hospitals and stuff. What kind of casualties did you, did you see come in? And did you see many fighters come in? Uh, so uh, uh, very early on, half of the cases that I was taking to the operating room were children uh, and the rest were families. You know, people were being killed and injured in their homes or in homes that they had sought refuge to. Uh, uh, or they were being taken out of the rubble uh, uh, as the few survivors when when a building is taken down. And so uh, uh, it it was very obvious that there was a kind of systematic destruction of life uh, through through targeting people inside their homes. So so you're saying you didn't really see many fighters no, coming in? No, I, I didn't see any fighters. And my theory was from, from, from the time I was there is that they, in addition to everything else, have a parallel medical health infrastructure because we literally did not see any fighting men. Hmm. Uh, um, and, so, and in your, yeah, sorry, go. Yeah, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. No, no, no. And in, and in your experience, because also Israel claims 
that Hamas uses Al Shifa as as its headquarters and other hospitals as like you know um, you know hiding places. I mean, you've worked in Gaza for years, many many times during many wars. Uh, what do you make of this claim that Hamas uses health facilities as as um, you know headquarters or, or something? So if if that was true, then people would not have been using the hospitals as a refuge center. You know, people would would realize if 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 people you know, and it, towards the end there are almost thirty to thirty five thousand internally displaced in Shifa alone. If people saw Hamas fighters there. They would have taken their families and their loved ones and ran away because they would have thought that this is now going to be targeted. And so by the very virtue of the fact that hospitals are the place people seek refuge in in Gaza highlights the fact that these are seen by the population as purely civilian institutions uh, uh, with no fighting men around them. And, and you know, when, 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 when the Israelis went into Shifa, uh, and none of these, what none of that narrative uh, was shown to be true. There was some kind of miserable, kind of mediocre attempts at showing you some, you know, ma uh, machine gun magazine next to an MRI, which we know nobody does because the MRI has a magnet that pulls these things. You know, there there were none of these graphics that were shown in that infamous. Uh, press conference where, where Israeli the Israeli army said that, that underneath Shifa was this total command and control center. And that's what I wanted to talk to you about, actually. Uh, despite this, despite this uh, ridiculous propaganda by Israel, that any, I mean, it's an insult to any human being and, and an insult to any journalist. We, we heard time and time over, and again, in the mainstream media, the mainstream media, the corporate media, taking Israel's side. Um, how does it make you feel uh, as a human being, but as a Palestinian? It was, I mean, when I was in there and, and, and you had to field calls from journalists, whatever ludicrous uh, 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 story the Israeli army would, would make, then becomes the proof that had to be disproved by the Palestinians. So the Israelis said that there were missiles coming out of a of a uh, uh, of a hospital. Then the, it was the job of the Palestinians to show that there were no missiles, even though the, the hospital would be full of journalists. And so the, it's not, you know, unhearing like unseeing is an active process driven by racism and by collusion. And the unhearing and the unseeing of Palestinians by the BBC, by the CNN, by NBC, by Sky, all of these uh, 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 media outlets is an active process by which the, they, be, they allowed themselves willingly and actively to become the propaganda pieces of a genocidal project. And, you know, I know it's not much relief to the victims, but history will not absolve them. History will not absolve these people in CNN and in BBC. And history will eventually identify them as the mouthpieces of a genocidal project in the 21st century. I, I mean, I can't agree more. Um, and, and something else that, that's happening is that it's actually the Palestinians themselves so victim of a genocide of a live you know live on your on our screens it's also the people standing in solidarity with them that are being portrayed as criminals right you were denied entry to germany then to france I and mean, then the ban was overturned uh, the um, the students fighting for justice all over the world are, are being you know targeted and arrested and beaten up by the police uh, demonstrations are forbidden um, again, like you talked about history, but the present moment is can be very disheartening and and very maddening. Uh, again, as a, as a Palestinian, how do you how do you feel about that? Do you do you trust that history will, in a way, you know, correct these things? Or but how does it make you feel now? The fact that you are being criminalized for being genocided. So 
Uh, one of the things that I discovered when I came out of Gaza is that the genocidal project is like an iceberg. And Israel is the, is the, the tip of the iceberg, but the rest of the iceberg is the axis of genocide. These governments from Berlin to London to Paris to Washington that are as, they're not, they, this is their genocidal project as much as it is the Israeli genocidal project. And the institutions of these ruling classes, the, the newspapers, the, the uh, 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 media outlets, are genocide enablers whose job it is to ensure the longevity of the genocide. That's why we're here eight months on. Today is Eid. We are now celebrating Eid. While there's a genocide that's going on, we're marking Eid eight months on, because these institutions, whether they are the medical institutions like the British Medical Association or the Royal College of Surgeons or the American Medical Association or the, or the Royal Medical Association or uh, 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 media outlets like the BBC or, or CNN or ITV or the parliamentarians in these uh, uh, countries, they are all genocide enablers. In that is a critical component of this genocidal iceberg. And um, the, I mean, in October when this started, and you know Israel very well, you know what Israel is capable of, because you've experienced it all over the years many, many times again. Did you ever think that eight, nine months down the line, we will still be experiencing this genocide? I honestly did not think that we, the world would let something like this happen in the 21st century. And while watching it live, you know, while watching these children being killed, while watching people being dismembered, while watching people being slaughtered, while watching people becoming uh, emaciated from the famine, the world would uh, allow this to happen and the world would collude actively. Uh, uh, and, and it's, uh, you know, you talk about, you talk about uh, the student movement, for me, as someone who has seen and lived through this genocide, uh, it's, it was the student movement that, re, uh, uh, that regained my uh, faith in Western societies. Uh, and, and until though that uh, 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 happened, we were heading towards a polarized belief of them versus us. Uh, us in the south, them in the north. And it was these, that moral purity and that moral clarity of the student movement that uh, somehow uh, 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 was able to send a message that actually people in the north, living in these countries where these governments are actively participating in the genocide, you know, the American army actively participated in the massacre in Nusayrat. British intelligence and British reconnaissance flights actively participate in this war. The Germans increased their, their weapons supply 10 times since the 7th of October. They are actively participating in the genocide. And it, it's that, you know, as societies are, are refusing to, to collude with these political institutions and these political classes, that you're getting some hope in humanity. I wanted to ask you a question also about, I mean, your family was expelled in 1948, expelled, a, a lot of them went to the Gaza Strip um, and became refugees. That's a, some of the context that's always missing, you know, when people say in the mainstream media, it all started on October the 7th. Can you, is it ever possible to explain what it means to be a displaced, displaced person or what it means to be a refugee in Gaza or in Palestine? So if you want to understand what it means to be a refugee, and the child of a refugee and, and the, the grandchild of a refugee. 
watch how despite all of the killing, despite all of the murder, despite all of the hunger and the destruction, Palestinians in Gaza have refused to become refugees again. So despite all of this killing, Palestinians believe that becoming a refugee is worse than what is happening to them. And that is how that continuous social death, you know, what we're witnessing is physical and biological genocide. Becoming a refugee is social genocide, where you lose your I, yourself, your community, your existence, and you live in perpetuity in that status of re- being refugee, in the status of being one of the world's surplus populations. And uh, I've got two questions left. Um... The, do you believe in international justice? I mean, we've seen what the ICC uh, is trying to do with the arrest warrants against Netanyahu and, and uh, Yov Gallant. We've seen uh, the ICJ coming up again and again with you know provisional measures to make Israel stop its, its genocide. Um, nothing much has happened in terms of the states, but it's still very important in terms of you know legal initiatives and what we can do then as civil society. So in a way, I I put two questions into one. So do you believe in international justice? And what do you think is the role, and you've touched upon this a bit, of civil society? And in a way, how can it be most impactful to stop this genocide? So, uh, of course, I believe in, in international justice. And now more than before, because I believe that this is the war where we either accept the Uh, rule of law, the rule of international law that humanity had agreed on after the horrors of the Second World War. Or we say, you know what, this was all a big lie. It's not about what you do. It's about who your victim is that determines whether international law applies to you. And we should not allow them, their cynicism, and their moral bankruptcy, the, the ruling elites in the West, to get away with this kind of, you know, that what, what Karim Khan of the ICC said had been told to him, that, you know, the ICC we created for Africans and for that thug Putin, not for us. You know, that's what Western governments want out of international law. And it is our job to use their sword against them uh, um, and to ensure that... Uh, there is accountability, there is a change in the language. You know, the importance of the ICJ uh, uh, provisional ruling is it legitimized the use of the term genocide because it said that this is not just a political term but a legal definition of what is happening. The ICC uh, uh, arrest warrants would basically identify everyone within the chain of command in the Israeli government to the Israeli army down to the genocidal soldier on the ground as being uh, 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 complicit in war crimes. And in terms of civil society, the students, people? You see, this is a system that's been created over 76 years to protect Israel and ensure total impunity. This is why when the war started, Israeli politicians and military leaders were so intoxicated by these 76 years of impunity that they verbalized their genocidal intent. They verbalized their ethnic cleansing desires. And therefore, what we this system has to be dismantled one institution at a time, one university at a time one uh, 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 medical association at a time, one scientific journal and medical journal and and media outlet at a time. They have to be taken apart, and that's the role of civil society. And the most important thing is, you know, the political culture in the West has to be changed. We have to keep insisting Support and complicity in genocide should disqualify individuals from holding public office. And as we are entering uh, uh, elections in the UK, as uh, elections are approaching in the United States, we need to apply this principle that goes beyond Gaza. If you are complicit in genocide, that should disqualify you from holding 
uh, uh, political office. And it's the job of the, the voters to ensure that that principle is upheld. Because after that, if we vote back individuals who are complicit in genocide, we deserve the kind of politics that we are going to get after Gaza. You know, if you think that, that Keir Starmer, uh, who, who actively supported the killing of 14, 15,000 Palestinian children, will care about the fact that a third of the children in the UK are under the, live under the poverty line. You're deluded. You know, morality is not compartmentalized like that. And it's the same if you believe that despite complicity in genocide, uh, uh, Joe Biden is uh, electable, then you deserve the kind of genocidal politicians that you get who will then dismantle their own societies. And that's what we saw in the Second World War. The Second World War and the Holocaust were the application of genocidal tactics and philosophies that had been used in the colonies for generations coming back into Europe. And genocide will come back into the societies that are complicit in it and that uh, actively support it. Shukran Iktir, Hassan and Eid uh, Mubarak. Um, thank you. I hope you get it to spend, you know, you get to spend it with your family and, and thanks again for taking thank the you. time to talk to me. Thanks, Hassan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye.